I used to play softball on Sundays, every Sunday for years. And uh, Guy B needed a ride home from Guy A. Guy A happened to have a copy of a script I'd written in the back of his car. Guy B says, can I read that script? Guy he says, sure. Guy B really likes the script. Guy B turns out to be pals with Mike Fennell. Mike Fennell's looking for a writer for The Howling. Guy B says, hey, I just read a really good script. It's Terry's. And uh, Mike Fennell thought so too. So did Joe Dante. So did everybody. So I got the gig. That's how I became the writer of The Howling. So the moral is, play softball on Sundays. The thing that you learn when you're a writer is that you have to make the story points clear. I, I know that seems obvious, but you really have to put a frame around them. Eventually you get really good at it as a writer. You, if you keep working, you're making your story points clear. And uh, one thing I was able to carry with me very specifically to the set for the first time I directed was, what's the story? What's the center of the story? What shot? Because you have an infinite number of places you can put the camera, right? But what place is it that tells the story the best? And since it's the story you're trying to tell, you've got to tell the story, go with that angle. I uh, had been writing uh, for the studios for Warner Brothers and Columbia and MGM uh, exclusively as a writer. I had an office at Columbia, it was kind of cool, but I wasn't making movies yet. And when this came along, it, uh, it, it was a great thing. Even though the money was about a quarter of what I'd been making, it isn't always about the money. It's about getting the work made. And um, in fact, uh, an old pal of mine, Clay Froman, wrote a Ed Zwick film recently, and I used to toast each other. We would say credits because we were working already, but what mattered was getting credits. And to finally get a credit on The Howling really helped me get going. It helped me, um, it didn't help me get more writing work exactly, but it did help me get directing work because they were able to say, oh, well, he did that, it worked, we have a movie like that. Um, let's see if we can, let's use him. It was a stepping stone, finally getting my name up there on the screen, screenplay by. Joe was great. Joe was uh, enthusiastic all the way up and down the line. Whether he believed in uh, the howling as a book or not, he never let on that he didn't. Uh, I don't think he did because the very first thing we did was throw the book out and start from scratch. And uh, he had lots of ideas, lots of input, lots of energy. Um, it's sort of the uh, the main thing I remember about Joe. We're still in touch a little bit. We're not pals or anything. But I've called him a few times and said, can you get me to so-and-so? And he's made a call. And um, he's a nice guy and really a, a, a library of knowledge of especially that kind of film. We pretty much used the title uh, and that's how it influenced it. His book was about a random girl that gets bit by a random guy or random wolf and uh, they go to a random place so that she can recover. And we got rid of all of that. We made her uh, somebody who was, the, the hip thing to do at the time was to have women reporters. It was the era of Jane Fonda in the China Syndrome and Morgan Fairchild was some reporter who'd been harassed by some guy. And so we made her a reporter. It was, it was the right thing to do at the time. And, and we couldn't have it be a, it can't be a random guy that bites her. It's gotta be a specific, werewolf guy who's a representative of this pack of people who live in a particular place and if she's going to go and recover wouldn't it be cool if the place that she went were actually uh, full of werewolves and she didn't know it so the gary brenner book didn't have very much to do with the movie the film's effects uh, deserve comment they were uh, i think it was the first time that the pneumatic werewolf was ever used and uh, they were they were in fact they were the star of the movie I know there were some pretty famous people in it but when the reviews came out it was the the effects that the uh, finger was pointed at as as being really spectacular and I, I think they were I think they were really um, innovative
And, you know, of course, they've been used, things have been done like that uh, a lot since. Roger's appearance in the film was, of course, a great laugh for anybody who ever met Roger Corman because uh, he steps into a phone booth uh, where the girl has just gone past. The girl has just used a phone booth. Remember phone booths? And, uh, and uh, she steps away, in steps. Oh, it turns out to be Roger Corman, and he checks to see if any money is in the slot. It's fallen down into the return change area. And, of course, everybody who's ever worked with Roger laughs because everybody knows that Roger will try to save a dime. And that's what would have been in there was a dime. So it was pretty funny. It worked well. Okay, mister, it's all yours. The names of the uh, f characters were uh, n based on directors of other films about werewolves. Uh, this was pure Joe Dante. He is a library of knowledge uh, about horror films and low-budget films, but, uh, horror films, I think especially, or gimmick things like that. And so it, it made perfect sense to to have Terrence Fisher and George Wagoner as the names, and it was fine by me. I mean, one less thing I have to think about is uh, character names. Great. Yeah, good idea. That's, that's fun. It'll be an in-joke. Some people will get it. Most people won't. I mean, the Garden Variety werewolf movie audience probably won't appreciate those, but uh, some of us will. The editing style of Mark Goldblatt, particularly in The Howling, was uh, extremely effective. Um, I wasn't there for it. You know, you're the middle the, uh, writer of it. You, you pretty much, it's gone beyond you. But what I remember uh, about the process of it was it didn't quite work. Never mind that it had a book, a writer, a writer, and another writer after me. When it was, uh, it wouldn't hang together. And uh, uh, Goldblatt... Uh, took the thing and reshaped it, blew a couple of shots up, removed people who were in the frame that weren't supposed to be there, story-wise, and, and made the thing work. And when you looked at it in the theater, as I did the first time, well, I couldn't tell. I mean, I'd known about this, but I was looking for the areas that he'd magically fixed. Eh, it was seamless. So it worked great. And he, he was also really good at doing the shock value things. A girl goes to the window and opens it. She's looking in that way, and when she looks out, the dog comes at her. Uh, this is great stuff. This is real horror movie stuff because it sets you up and puts you on edge for the next thing that's going to happen, and he really had it down. The score by Pino Donaggio, they were really lucky to get him, I think. Of course, um, it's right in his wheelhouse, that kind of thing. Um, he's done, I think, Brian De Palma movies, uh, all, all sorts of things. Uh, it, it was really effective in The Howling. Um, per se comment, you know, it gave me chills. It was, uh, it was great. They were lucky to get him. Did the film differ in its uh, final result from what my vision of it was on the way in? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Um, there's an infinite number of places to put the camera, and where Joe put the camera might have been different from where I put the camera. The way it was constructed, uh, just scene by scene or shot by shot, might not have been the same as what I was picturing. But there it was. It told the same story that I told. And, and you know, it was a thrill. It was the first time that something I'd written had gotten up there and been completed. and. And uh, it, whether it was different or not didn't really matter to me. It was a great buzz. There was one aspect that I thought I understood that didn't quite manage to get into the film. Uh, traditionally, uh, people who've been bitten by werewolves and become this thing that haunts the night uh, regret it and, and are, per, you know, devoured by the devil inside or something like that. And... It wasn't the case here. These people were werewolves who wanted to continue being werewolves. 
Yeah, well, you know, that, that runs counter to just about all the werewolf lore that we know. And, and, and it occurred to me that maybe it's the sex. Maybe they, they can put themselves out of their human confines in such a way to maintain their identity but release themselves to an extent that, uh, that that's why they would fight to preserve the way they live. And I, I thought that was a kind of interesting idea. I still do. And there wasn't quite enough of it. I mean, I, I, he, he sort of nibbled at the edges of that. There's a couple of times that people are sort of at the side of the frame fooling around, but you don't quite know what it is. I mean, it requires a real getting inside of it and exploring it that, that wasn't there in, in the end. But it was still a cool film. And for them, it was about the hand that gets chopped off and, and, and not the psychological part. But... It's still cool. As a sign-off about the howling, uh, I've said it before, it, it, I was incredibly happy that I got a chance to get uh, my name up there on a film, a film that was so good, too. Uh, I thought it was first cabin all the way. Uh, Joe didn't let anything go. All the characters, all the cast members were terrific, even though they weren't like hugely famous. Dee Wallace was pretty big at the time because she'd been in 10. Um, and Slim Pickens was great. It was an, a low-budget movie that was really well-crafted and had a really great frame around it is the best way to say it. Uh, you couldn't tell that you couldn't tell that it was ever short on anything that it needed. And I was delighted to be involved with it and I'm delighted to say to this day that yeah, I, I co wrote the howling. Cool, huh? I'm going now. And heaven help you. <laughs>